Welcome, everybody, to the Banyan Books podcast. My name is Ross McKeechee, and today we have a wonderful special guest, uh, a second interview. We interviewed him the first time two weeks ago, and this is a follow-up for his second new release book, Martin Prechtel. Now, uh, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that although we have people joining from all over the world listening to this podcast, the physical location of Banyan Books and Sound is on the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Now, Banyan Books is in its 50th year in business as an independent bookstore in Vancouver, privately owned independent bookstore, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. So please support Banyan Books. All of your purchases do support this kind of wonderful free programming that we're able to offer the community. Banyan's website is banyan.com. That's B-A-N-Y-E-N.com. Or you can go in in person seven days a week. We're open every day at the corner of 4th and Dunbar in Kitsilano, Vancouver. Our guest today, as an avid student of Indigenous eloquence, innovative language and thought, Martin Prechtel is a writer, artist, and teacher who, through his work, both written and spoken, hopes to promote the subtlety, irony, and pre-modern vitality hidden in any living language. A half-blood Native American with a Pueblo Indian upbringing, he left New Mexico to live in the village of Santiago Atitlan, Guatemala, eventually becoming a full member of the Sutujil Mayan community there. For many years, he served as a principal in that body of village leaders responsible for piloting the young people through the meanings of their ancient stories in the rituals of adult rites of passage. Once again, residing in his beloved New Mexico, Prechtel teaches at his international school, Bolad's Kitchen. Through an immersion into the world's lost seeds and sacred farming, forgotten music, magical architecture, ancient textile making, metal smithing, and making and using of tools, musical instruments, and food, and the deeper meanings of the origins of all these things in the older stories and ancient texts, and by teaching through the traditional use of riddles. Prechtel hopes to inspire people of every mind and way to regrow and revitalize real culture and to find their own sense of place in the sacredness of a newly found daily existence in love with the natural world. Prechtel lives with his family and their native Mesta horses in northern New Mexico. His previous works include Secrets of the Talking Jaguar, Long Life, Honey in the Heart, The Disobedience of the Daughter of the Sun, Stealing Benefacio's Roses, The Unlikely Peace, at Kuchumakik, and the smell of rain on dust, grief and praise. Now, our former interview two weeks ago, which will be getting posted soon, was on his other new release book called Rescuing the Light. And today he's here speaking with us about his new book, which is the first in a trilogy called The Mare and the Mouse, Stories of My Horses, Volume 1. Martin, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us for a second time. Oh, thank you, Ross Mikichi. Thank you for letting me come over and b- via this kind of electron prismic ways. It's cool. Man. <laughs> nice to hear your voice again. Likewise. And I, I wanted to tell you, Martin, that you have a distinct honor in the Banyan Books world, which is you have one of, we have all these bookmarks at Banyan. And one of the things that's great is we have these stacks, these displays of all these different bookmarks in the store, or if people mail order, (laughs) they get tucked into the books and you have one of your quotes is on those bookmarks. Those bookmarks have all kinds of different quotes on them. And I'll just read out that quote. It says, humans feast the holy in the wild with the beauty of what their hands can make as offerings and what their voices can make with their delicious, meaningful prayer music. All right. Sounds good to me, man. Let's make some more bookmarks. (laughs) (laughs) Good idea. (laughs) Hey, that's good. That's a nice choice. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. 
Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. Now you're joining from your from your home in New Mexico, where you have Bullad's Kitchen. Is that right? Well, yeah, Bullad Kitchen right now is kind of like all over the world because of the COVID nineteen you know, restrictions and everything. But yeah, uh, Bullad Kitchen was meeting here for fifteen over well, actually almost longer, seventeen years. But yeah, we have a big adobe building. <laughs> I don't know how to put it, it's, it looks like. Uh, it's so funny. It's a funny building. It's gigantic. It can hold 300 students, you know, and it's, it's got uh, these massive vigas, these beams, you know, from the tops of the mountain where there was this forest fire, and it's got two, two-foot-thick walls and these gigantic blue gates and doors, everything handmade from recycled materials and by people who are students or friends of students and blacksmiths. Matter of fact, the guy that made the hinges, the native guy, he just passed away. He got go COVID and killed him, but... It's just everything in the in the school. If you go in there, is every little nut and bolt, and everything is just got a story behind it, enormous. And so we we uh, had the, all the students come there for years and years. But this last year and a half, we we haven't had anybody come because of course the state wouldn't allow it. But we're hoping to set, uh, start up again this following year, and if not, a year after that. But meantime, Bullet Kitchen is basically. Me writing these people letters and them writing me letters, and we're still kind of going at it. It's very amazing. I'm, it's like unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, Bullock Kitchen was there. And uh, we actually originally started downtown uh, Ojo Caliente, you know, which is a town of about 90 people. But uh, yeah, really crowded down there where we are here. There's eight. But it's a uh, big time. Uh, Beautiful, you know, what I guess people from other wet places call dry, but. You know, it's uh, full of canyons and cobble and sand. But our sand is very interesting because it's not uh, silicone sand, like most sand, like a beach sand. It's all feldspar, you know, so it's really amazing stuff. And uh, But the funny thing is the water table is very close underneath, you know, and so it's uh, it got all sorts of wild plants and, and things waiting in the ground to sprout whenever it rains or snows or does different things. It can get down to about normally to 18 below zero in the middle of winter and gets up to 104 in the summer, but it's always cool at night no matter when you come here. You know, it's one of these places that <laughs> people say, oh, you live in New Mexico, must be warm. You know, I say, well, there are days, you know, when it's warm in the day, but at night it always gets down to 48, 45. And in the middle of the summer, no matter how hot it gets in the day, and then in the winter, ooh, it gets way down there. So... It's, you know, not exactly what everybody thinks. We have beavers on our river in the middle of the desert. You know, it used to be otters, unfortunately, but not anymore. But I could ramble on and on. So Bullet Kitchen in the middle of that kind of thing. But it's also in the middle of all the the Spanish-American uh, towns and villages. And right around here, we're exactly where we are. It used to be the, it's the cradle of all the the Karis and the Tiwa people originally before the you know Spanish came. They're now a little bit farther down river, but... Yeah, so it's uh, we've got a ruined Pueblo just about three-quarter of a mile to the south, I'm pointing at it, and then we got another one about half a mile to the north, and then the other original one, Pozawinke, up there at the springs itself is about five miles away. So, it's, you know, it's surrounded by ruins everywhere and old fields and amazing things that people have no idea what it is today, you know. Like everywhere you go riding your horse, you run across. You, I never touch any of these things, but you, you'll see these strangely chipped rocks. And nobody, you know, none of the anthropologists can figure out what they are. Nobody, because they're like made like propellers on one side, opposite sides of chipping. But they're originally net weights for the weights that the people used to uh, weight their nets that they made out of human hair to catch rabbits and antelope off their field when they had the big drives. So because the, where I grew up, you know, they still have the tradition of knowing about that. And uh, so you you see this laid out everywhere because when the people would go back to stop hunting, they would just leave the weights there and then come back and tie them on, you know. So it's one of those very mysterious, wild, crazy places full of petroglyphs. Well, there's just not as many people as some other places, but too many for me now. But you know how it goes with us guys, you know. We, <laughs> <laughs> we always like to be, oh, no, there's 80 people in 15 miles. <laughs> Jesus, we got to move, you know. <laughs> but, uh, I like villages anyway it's okay so anyway sorry I got off the subject there but Bullet Kitchen is in that sort of pot of Adobe so I don't allow anybody to have cell phones or computers or 
use any of those things except in emergencies, of course. And and that way they're they're in a pressure cooker of um, being together as people, like as people should be. You know. Mm. Uh, yeah. It sounds like a beautiful place, and I know that you have a website for people that would are interested in joining some of your programs, and that's floweringmountain.com is that right yes uh uh-huh. right yeah that's the website there's there's lots of places you can well you have to talk to jake hurst if you want to because <laughs> we got quite a, a mailing list or what do you call it, waiting list because of course we have a new class that has been ready to jump in but couldn't come because of the way it was with the sicknesses and so they're still sitting there waiting to come and then there's a whole waiting list behind them and so i don't know you know, how long we're going to plan to live so we can teach all these people. But, yeah, and I still have my old groups, too. And it's, people just never leave. I mean, the first group we ever had, I never thought anybody would come anyway. And I still got people that have been coming for over 15 years, and they just won't leave. And so, you know, it was supposed to be four years. <laughs> put in there. And they're still here. You know, I watched all their kids grow up. They've got grandkids, and these guys are getting white hair, and their teeth are falling out. It's just like... Okay, well, here they are. They're coming back. And uh, I don't know if that says anything about my teaching. Maybe it's not very good. It's, you know, they have to keep coming back to try to learn it. But I think it's probably just being together that we all love so much. So. Yeah. Plus, the tea is good, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I let well, everybody's kids come. Everybody can bring their kids and their old folks, you know, in this giant village, you know. So... Wonderful. Now this this new book you've you've put out the first in in a series of three volumes, titled "The Mare and the Mouse: Stories of My Horses." And you know, it's stories. This is my my take on it. First of all, it's a beautiful book. I was really enamored with it. I have to say, like I every time I got excited about sitting down and reading. And it's oh, not good. just stories, <laughs> but teachings, and and it changes your your heart and your mind in a beautiful way too. And it, you know, it's it's like your love affair with horses, but also you're just talking about New Mexico and the place where you live, and it's as much about your love affair with that place and the land there. Yeah, well, probably that more than anything else. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. I, I, New Mexico is the funniest place in the world, in the United States, anyway. I mean, you're in Canada, you know, so you get off the hook. But the, and people in the United States, you know. Most of them, unless they've been to New Mexico, and even them, they don't really know that New Mexico exists. If you even look at it, guidebooks, you know, New Mexico is basically western Arizona or eastern Arizona and, or western Texas or southern Colorado or northern Mexico. And, and New Mexico, where is it? You know, it's not even, even the guidebooks for birds and mammals, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> lizards. You know, there's all these animals that are here that no one writes about because they say, oh, that's just a subspecies of the Colorado this or a subspecies of the of the Arizona that. And so New Mexico has successfully kind of like not existed for a lot of people psychologically anyway. I remember there was a famous football player named Jim Brown when I was a kid. You know, he married a girl from the town we were in. And every time they'd interview him, you know, in the football games, they'd say, where are you from, New Mexico? I'd say, oh, is that like by Chihuahua, you know, and nobody... He was like, what do you mean? And he was uh, an African-American guy who grew up here, you know, and it's like, hey, nobody knows where it is. So a lot of times people who come from other places to New Mexico, they come kind of like with a colonial mind, you know, like they're going to take over and show us how to do what we don't know how to do, all the permaculture, and we're not doing this right, and you got any roaded arroyo. I said, well, man, arroyo is just, you know, it's just how God made it, you know. It's, you can't stop <laughs> New Mexico from eroding. This is not California. So... And then they just get frustrated and leave, and then some people stay and, and love it. So there's people from all over the place here, and people have been coming here, you know, from all over the world for years, but very few stay. But the few that stay, they add to the, the what a lot of New Mexicans call the um, the chili stew to make it a beautiful, amazing cultural place it is, you know. So I decided that I, I wanted to talk, because everybody thinks of me, oh, my, Martin Preto, Mayans, you know. <laughs> Guatemala, that's for sure, but this is my homeland, you know, this is where I'm from, and I love it, and it's always being put down and always last on the list and always thrown away and always this, that, and the other, and I thought, no, we've lived life here that's not the same as the rest of the United States, and 
it's gradually creeped up on us too. But uh, I thought, no. Nah. And then my horses, they're, they're the only reason I'm alive besides my family, you know. And so I thought, no, it's time to write some of these gold adventures down. Plus, I mean, you know how it is, Ross. Russ, if you, if you, uh, you know, you don't live fully when you're young, you got to tell lies when you're old, you know. People don't believe anything you're going to say. And so I don't have to tell no lies whatsoever, man. I just keep telling exactly what happened to everybody. Goes, no! I said, no, really. Uh, uh, uh. So I said, I'm going to write it down, you know. So here yeah. we Beautiful. Well, thank you for that. And, and so it's a love story to New Mexico, and it centers around all these different horses that have come and gone in your life. And one of the yeah. beautiful things I've learned so much in, in the story titled Horse as Water Monster, oh, you yeah. trace the origins and the mythologies of horses around the world. I was so surprised mm-hmm. to hear of horses' connection with water. Can you tell yeah. us about that? Everybody, well, can't read the chapter. You know, I mean, it's very small. I'm going to write another book on horses one of these days. You've got to give us all life and, and time. But... There's a lot to say. Very few people um, really realize that. I mean, horses, like with the, all the Irish and the Scots and the, and the original continental Celts up in Galicia and, and all the way into Asia, everywhere you talk or everywhere you read or look at the mythology, the horses always come out of water. They're always coming out of the sea, mostly. And nobody really knows exactly what happened, but there's a big theory now that most of the horses, at least the ones we got here or, or used to have here, are um, basically brought by boat people from Asia and in, in North Africa and in uh, the Iberian coast there off of Portugal and up into parts of Europe. And when they would bring these horses, because Africa has no indigenous horses, they have uh, indigenous donkeys and zebras and things like that, but there are no no horses. But they're full of horses. They got the horses, but they're not indigenous. They come from somewhere else. And so it's it's been imagined that they came on uh, on boats. And for centuries, and this is you know even recorded historically, whenever any of the type of boat, even uh, you know like Columbus and all those characters, but also all of these English people and all of these guys, you know, bringing uh, shipments of horses into you know Charleston. They didn't load them off ramps. They they um, pushed them overboard, and they had to swim ashore. And horses swim pretty good, you know, as long as they don't have any bridle or saddles on them. They swim really, really good. And so, you know, the first horses that anybody would ever see would be always rising out of the sea. So you can just imagine, you know, some guy, you know, shucking his uh, mollusks, you know, along the coast of uh, uh, Santiago Compostela area, and all of a sudden here comes all these horses out of the surf, you know. So... Uh, mythologically, they all come from, you know, with the Greeks, they'll come from Poseidon or from other people. They come from these guys or those guys. And always from the water, always from the water. So we had this one crazy horse where I grew up on the reservation that nobody owned. I don't know where he came from. So, I mean, uh, where I grew up, the native people of Caras, uh, Pueblos, they were tremendous traders. I mean, they make a lot of jewelry and they trade, and we always come back with sheep and cattle and horses. And all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. I still have nine horses I've never claimed over Neville Riz. Actually, I traded for one, you know, like 20 years ago. But um, I don't know. But anyway, this big white horse, which is not a horse anybody would normally have, was the plow horse. And also the Wrangler horse was basically a cutting horse because the, the tribe raised, you know, maybe about 800 to 1,000 mama cows. And we had to brand him every year. Man, this horse knew exactly what to do. You know, he was just like on it. And none of us had any horses that knew what to do. <laughs> we, you know, they were, what they were, they were little and tough, but, you know, nobody had any roping horses and that sort of thing. And this guy, he was it, man. But no one could ever find They just set him loose like, well, they'd use him for have him down, you know, plowing in the spring, and then they'd be branding all the spring calves and whatever they, whoever they could find up in the hills. And uh, then they let him go after he was done. So about 10 months of the year, he just had to fend for himself out there, which he did a very good job of. But no one ever knew where the heck he was. I mean, he was just, and this reservation is big. I mean, it's thousands and thousands of acres, you know, many, many square miles. And uh, no people, just in the village. And we, they'd send the young guys out on horses to go find him every spring. It would take him, you know, two weeks to a month to even get a sign of him. But I, I learned how to catch him, and I'll, I'll leave the the story in the book so you can you know at least have some joy reading that just by serendipitous luck of my own but uh 
He was always, whenever I caught him, I never caught him coming out of the land. I caught him coming out of the Rio Grande River. He was always just his head like a crocodile. <laughs> you know, he'd come up, this big old white horse, and he'd take <laughs> off. And, you know, and there he was. And, I, and and when he disappeared, you know, he disappeared. I was already out of the village. I wasn't there anymore. You know, he must have been a thousand years old by then. And everybody said he was dead, but no one ever found his bones. No one ever saw him dead, man. And I said, I swear to God, this guy was a spirit. He lived in the, I think he lived in the river, you know, but nobody knew. He just went, he was gone, you know. So it was pretty amazing. So it was one of the earliest, not the earliest horse memories I have, but, you know, certainly, you know, one of the most vivid. And I got to ride him a couple of times. Everybody loved riding him because he... He, he made you look like you're a really good rider, you know. They'd tack him all up, take three guys to hold him down, you know. He was like you know, trying to saddle a rhinoceros, you know. And once you got on him, man, he was like ready to do the job. And don't tell him how to do it. He knew exactly what we needed to do, you know. Just tiny little cue and off we go. So we, he really is kind of the one taught me how to ride besides my mom. So. Very cool. Yeah, I love that story. Martine, if I can share a quote from uh, the story Icicles. And, and mm. it leads me into a question that I have for you. Um, is it okay if I read this? Yeah, sure. Okay. Of That's the whole so, idea. People supposed yeah. to read <laughs> and it's meant to be read out loud. I'm telling you, I wrote it so people could read it out loud. There'll be an audio book of it probably in December, but not yet. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. Okay. I got too many in front of me, so... That's really good to know. And I can see that. These are great stories to read out loud around the fire. Yeah, they're perfect. People can read them and they make a lot more sense to them if they read them out loud, you know, because the syntax is made specifically for that. You know. Well, this specific quote I actually had in my backpack when I went out with my family, and I'm sorry to say we were hiking. We went out for <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really against hiking. It's just an Indian thing, you know. I know, I know. And, and our audience <laughs> will understand that in a minute. I chose this quote. I thought it was too funny and I had to share it. So we were sitting around at this spot called Skookumchuck Narrows, uh, the northern tip of the southern Sunshine Coast here, where the water floods in and creates these wow. whirlpools and rapids. And anyways, we sat there and I read this to them after our hike. So I'll, I'll share it with everybody right now and they'll mm -hmm. get the context. So Martine writes, how I longed for a good mountain horse to ride up and into that untrammeled territory where those birds force field of sounds claimed the cliffs, caves, springs and trees. We're moving a little bit more at home on the back of an animal who herself probably would always long for her own home in a herd she'd never known and most likely never find, but in whose nostril steam, brain vapors, and the smell of sweat that rose off her backbone, I could inhale the medicine of her own powerful faith in the internal directive of belonging to the land her herd searching hooves faithfully tread, and in that at least with her together have some complicity in the sanity of always heading home into nature, instead of my usual failed attempt to dodge the shallow goals of civilization by rushing away from home to hide in a forest-bound flight. But that right. day, no horses did I have. With a family of four to sustain, basically refugees with a hand-to-mouth money situation, we had no way to have horses. So once again, I walked. I walked the mountains, the creeks, the canyons. Following the voice of the giant, the voice of the stone, the canyon wren, and it was as grand as it could be, considering. But thank God, at least I wasn't hiking. <laughs> <laughs> that was so terrible. <laughs> and then you go on to say, I hoped no one had seen me moving through the hills on foot and figured I'd been hiking. For if anyone had thought that what our people did when we walked gathering medicine in the hills or making prayers to understand what permission the customs of the animals to whom we bowed demanded, or what offerings of beauty or voice the bodies living in the roots and stones needed to have or hear for us to have been allowed to pull and dig them was just some kind of a pastime or an outdoor sport. Hiking to quote unquote, get a hit of nature to put us back together so one could go back into that bubbling people packed wreckage they call modern life. That would have been too much for my pride. Q, 
Can you tell us a bit about what it means to walk or ride as a spiritual work, a mission, or a prayer? Yeah. No, you read that very well, by the way. That makes mm-hmm. me feel so good, that, oh. the way you read that. And it, it sounds so beautiful, and it's exactly was hoping that people would love that. Mm-hmm. Well, to begin, um, where to begin? Mm-hmm. Natural people on the earth, that's all they do. They don't do anything else but what you just described. That's not unique to me in any way whatsoever. And people who just are always leaving to go somewhere else, that's modern culture. And it has, I say modern, but it's it's been around for several thousand years. Always leaving, always going somewhere else to get something after you've trashed where you are. Never really in love with where you are. And knowing that just by the way you move your legs, your feet, your waddle, your little butt, the way you move your arms, it's got to be something that feeds the holy in nature. It's got to be the one that feeds the natural world some kind of spiritual nutrition by the way you are. So going about the way you live, even if it's rowdy, you know, when we went with kids, you know, 16-year-old kids on horses, we're not like exactly, a, you know, a bunch of English people on a bridal path. I mean, it's boom, out there going. But every little bit was, you know, just beautiful and did not kill where we were. And we weren't going somewhere to get something. We were not mining what was surrounding us. We wanted to be part of what was surrounding us. And not only part of it, but was so integrally that land was us that we knew our own, we were actually running through our own arteries and running through our own intestines and running through our own nervous system. We weren't like something that was visiting. So we never visited where we were. We were from that place, man. So that was something that got lost a lot uh, when I was growing up because of the, you know, influx of stuff from come from elsewhere that everyone in the modern world is going for. But not all horses, you know, are conducive to that. But uh, with the right horse, they force you to drop into that, you know. In other words, the way you move on, so you've got to watch. It's, okay, I'm not going to crush that uh, old pottery of the people who used to be here, and I'm also not going to pick it up because it doesn't belong to me because it's not modern finders, keepers, losers, weeper. I'm not going to go mine and take this plant out of the hillside. I'm not going to go mine and kill this animal and take its heart because I need it. Everything has to be asked for, and permission has to be given. And it's the way you approach those places that makes it holy. So, like, when I was coming back from Guatemala, and, uh, I mean, the heartbreak is hard to explain. I don't think I ever could totally really explain it, but... Um, and I was back in my homeland, but it was pretty much changed. A lot of things have changed. When I would be going along those hills, you know, I mean, I, I, I didn't make trails. What I did is I found the trails of mountain sheep that had been extirpated from there, had been killed a long time ago, along with the natives in the particular area I was at. But the natives that had been in the particular area where I was at were still living in a town called Hamas, and they're still there today. They're descendants. And they were mountain sheep people, man. That's what the, all the other natives called them, mountain sheep people, you know. And Tibet and Nitsan. And, and I was following these uh, trails. You couldn't see them, you, but you could sense them. And you could see them under the oak brush and underneath the ponderosas, and you could finally find them. And so I, re, I, try, I, I was forced to walk with my horses exactly like those sheep had walked. <laughs> Otherwise, man, you're over the edge and you're dead. I don't know if you've ever seen mountain sheep going around, man. They're like very agile. And it was just such a tremendously wonderful thing for me because I would be walking in their footsteps and they would take me to all the holy places. I mean, they're not, they weren't alive anymore. They weren't there anymore, but their trails were still there. And so in our neural synapses in our souls, those mountain sheep trails are still there. And if you ride or walk or move through your life in such a way that you're trying to feed the holy by the way you go, not just to get somewhere and get a hit of the holy and then run back home to that horrible life everybody's addicted to and then driving them crazy instead of being where you are, and then you become part of the offering that's made to that place, then you see you're not a tourist anymore. And uh, so it becomes a totally different way of doing things. And that's why I wrote this book, because I wanted people to see that, you know, I mean, not a lot of people ride horses, God knows. I mean, 
millions of people riding horses and they're little, you know, going around circles in their arenas and competing with each other and, you know, and Kentucky Derby and this thing and that. They ain't got no relationship whatsoever to what I'm writing about in this book. So, I don't know. I couldn't go on and on, but probably better just to read the book. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think everyone should read this book. And well, well thank that, you. that actually leads me into another question. You talk about these you know, riding horse, the Kentucky Derby, you talk about what really makes a horse a full horse. And you talk about uh-huh. these, three, these three aspects. I, I think it was, you, the, there's just, the, there's the physical body. And you, you talk about a lot of these people who say they love horses and they want to keep a certain genetic breed alive, but there's read not the just next the physical book gets really horse. heavy on that. Yeah. Right. right. Can you tell us about that? There's, you said, well, the thing is, it goes along with everything, not just horses, but horses are very, very clear. I mean, when you try to preserve a breed, you automatically pretty much become a racist because, you know, you're trying to make something only this race or only this kind of dog or this kind of person or this kind of color or this kind of form. But what actually makes the certain uh, horses is very, very obvious. For instance, I'll just give a small example. It's a kind of a humorous one. It's in a different book, but... And there's a, an area of um, the Caucasus Mountains on the other side, uh, between the Caspian and the Black Sea, where there was a tribal people who was known as the Kabardi. And they're, you know, relatives of the Abgas and the Circassians. And uh, they were really good horse people, they the most incredible horses. And, and nowadays they call them the Kabardi horses. And these horses relied on these guys stealing horses from the next tribe over to get the stallion to breed with their mares, and the foals being stolen back by some other guys. The actual calculation of how many rounds a horse had gone before it actually ended up back where it started being stolen or (laughs) or sold or traded back was so amazing. But that's what kept the breed standard for them. They didn't have like a book or a stud book, or, you know, this has got to be this, or this has got to be that. But it's always exogamous breeding, like seeds, where this horse is going to breed with a a mare that is not from their people, but from another family of people. So the people themselves live with their horses such that their people and their horses are of a kind. But if those people start breeding with their own daughters and their own sisters and brothers, pretty soon you're going to have a big, terrible situation, and the same goes for the horses. But as long as those horses are always being bred out, in other words, if a sunny boy marries this beautiful girl over here and her people have this kind of horse, but it's the same kind of horse, but it's not the same family. And so they, their horses breed together just like they make babies together, and they grow up together. And that's what Mongols do to this day. So instead of having a breed of horses, you have a culture of horses, and you have a culture of people. And when that happens, then you're not keeping alive a breed by keeping alive a form inside a city, inside uh, what you would say a synthetic situation. So when people say, oh, I'm going to keep alive, you know, the Spanish Barb uh, Mustang or the Caspian Pony, within 20 years, that breed has atrophied so incredibly because the opinions of the people of what a horse should look like starts to make it so they start breeding for form again. And pretty soon you've either got a quarter horse all over again with all its little thin bones and its thin little hoofs and its colic and all this stuff that everybody doesn't like about it. Or the horse starts to disintegrate because it's not meant to be bred back on itself. This is like a wild seeds are always meant to be bred from another pasture out in the open. So all the really old-time horse people, cattle people and sheep people, I'm not talking about in the United States. I'm talking about like, you know, 2000 B.C. or the Mongols or the Scythians. They would never keep stallions, and they never would keep bulls, and they never keep rams. They had them only wild and feral running out there. And so when you want to breed, you take your animal out there, and it breeds whatever wild animal, and so it rewilds your so-called domestic animal, you see. So the land itself also carves the way these horses have to adapt to ride and to move, to eat, to know where to change pastures. And the nomadic peoples, they went with their horses, man. The horses didn't go with them. They went where they went in order to uh, negotiate all their different types of uh, food that you need at different times of year and different times of weather. So the first thing is the, the fact is that the land itself is the one that dictates. Second is that the, the people's culture has to be there. 
And then, of course, the third thing, naturally, is, of course, the horse's uh, genetic uh, presence in the first place, or people's or anybody else. But if the culture of the people that has the horse is not there, then the horse is, uh, just like you and me, we are now loners. If the land isn't there where the horse was made in the first place, sooner or not, I mean, if you take, for instance, one of the horses that uh, is a Mesto horse from New Mexico, which has happened a lot of times, to Ohio, <laughs> there's a guy, a very famous guy, took and it's raising them there pretty soon. They develop laminitis. Pretty soon they got this problem. Pretty soon they got this thing in their joints because they're being kept in a corral. They're being fed, um, you know, they're in the barn when it rains. And they're being fed this soft food on soft land and on water that's very soft. They don't have to negotiate any mud or any. No negotiations of anything. In the, and slowly, and then they don't have to deal with herd mentality. They don't have to deal with the herd um, politic. The mayors being the head of the rule, you know, and all of that stuff, and they become basically refugees. And if they're lucky enough to have a herd of a whole bunch of other crazy refugees that have all been combined into these weird little groups that people do, then they can probably form a third, a new kind of thing altogether that adapts to a kind of soft, marshmallowy modern way of life. But still, uh, in the long run, the horse that the people were quote unquote trying to preserve is disappeared, and people can't figure that out. It's like you get French people who really like their wine, right? And they'll be growing Bordeaux or, you know, Champagne or this, that, and the other. And you'll have somebody who, you know, very blithely, you know, steals a couple of shoots of Bordeaux uh, grapes and flies it to Tennessee and tries to grow Bordeaux wine in Tennessee. What you get is Tennessee wine. You don't get Bordeaux wine because Bordeaux wine has to be grown in Bordeaux in the same way it's been grown for, like, 3,000 years. And it's, it goes with plants, it goes with people, and it goes with uh, uh, horses. Really, really quickly you see that, and corn, too, is another thing. So, uh, you know, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to buy me one of those horses that Martin had, and then I'll, I'll be able to do all those things. I said, well, you got to buy all the land, too, and the culture and everything else that goes with it, you know. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some throwbacks out there or there aren't some horses and people too who don't have the indig- who have indigenous soul and it just comes percolating now they're with or without the permission of what they're surrounded by so the great sorrow and depression that modern people feel and constantly uh, battling is instead of a battle should be understood basically as uh, that great spiritual horse looking for its herd but there's no herd to have the herd they have is a public which is not the same thing so I was trying to point out in these books is that I was left without my people. And I was looking for horses. Now, the horses in this book, uh, first book, there's only one that's a mess of horse. And you get to the second book, you get a whole pile of <laughs> very famous horses. I'm going to tell you about it. A lot of crazy things together. But in the point is that still, even then, with the right, I don't know what right is a great word, but with a conducive atmosphere and feeling inside your heart and the land itself is the one that carves us into beings so i think that's what's you know if you read it you probably get that idea you know. yeah beautiful now if if i could jump to another quote from the book martin which again leads into sure. a question this is this is from the story titled eggs and, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Me yeah. And it's well, now you know how I really am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I let it out of the bag. Uh, yeah. My early days. And... Yeah, well, this it starts with talking about a saddle. You say a well-fitting saddle with stirrups helps distribute a good rider's weight and equilibrium more evenly over a horse's physique, especially in steep up-and-down terrain. Whereas riding bareback, no matter how skinny, light, and balanced a rider might be, transfers all the rider's weight and movement from the hip bones right to two small spots on either side of the horse's spine, impairing the nerve flow up and down the back, and often causes the rider to hang on a bit with her legs, causing difficulty with the horse's rib fascia, and can so easily confuse leg signals. But, be that as it may, a saddle had I none. So bareback, it was. You go on to say, moving through the wild highland cliffs, trees, and animals of summer pumped my soul's blood back into a long, deprived crevice in myself, where what I really might be hibernated, hopeful and formulating like an insect in a chrysalis. As we rode, 
I rode toward myself a little more each day. In a way she'd probably never been, I wanted Juniper, for our audience to know that's the horse, I wanted Juniper to get strong. Though with horses, it's hard to judge. For if even once in their earlier life, they have gone all the way into being in some kind of shape, then no matter, what, no matter whatever transpires, even years of being forgotten in some pen, if you look hard, you can generally see a layer of fire and capacity still rippling through their fascia. And that's what I saw. The little mare had done something somewhere for someone. But to really get going, I needed a saddle. So, of course, having no money and remembering all my mother's and father's resourceful ancestors and the intensely clever, inventive native spirit I'd grown up with, where people created all sorts of inventions with what was available to solve every situation in farming, in the kitchen, as kids with homegrown toys, I decided to make myself and Juniper a saddle. <laughs> and they did. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us... A little chicken snare. What's that? A little chicken snare saddle. Yeah. A little chi- Right. Now, this, mm-hmm. this kind of resourcefulness is completely foreign to us modern folks who have... It's basically atrophied. That's this idea of atrophying is something we discussed right. in the last conversation. Can you tell mm-hmm. us more about this resourcefulness, this inventiveness of your ancestors well, and the native spirit? Well, that's, that's, it's natural. I mean, the fact that people don't have now is not that the, it's not in them. It's, just, it's, a, it's like an organ that has atrophied. And I invented Bullet Kitchen for the specific purpose of, you know, I mean, there are some natives that, you know, don't like the idea of me teaching everybody you know, doing lots of things. And I said, no, nah, let these people swim back to Europe. I said, man, everywhere is the same story, you know. We all got to, we're in here together. We got to do what we can. So the capacity for people to create things has actually also created, you know, Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos, you know, trying to blast off from a trashed place to go to some other place to grow potatoes, you know, which is ridiculous instead of healing the place that they already messed up with what they're already doing. But if you're the inventiveness of people is unbelievable. I mean, people can do things that are incredible. And in villages and in, in tribes, I mean, there's no way to stay alive unless you have that inventiveness. I mean, every 15 seconds, you've got to figure this out. My kids are always saying, Papa, how did you fix that? How did you do that? I said, well, I'm not a fixer. But it's just the in- ingenuity has been beat out of us because everything's supposed to be specialized. You do this, and this is not my job. And But you're supposed to know how to do everything. So where I grew up, and then when I lived in Guatemala, in uh, Santiago Titlán, in, um, you know, the Tutu Hill village down there, I was always so startled to find out later that everybody in modern life didn't know how to do everything. You know, it's like <laughs> it's like all these in, in, in uh, the reservation where I grew up. They would no one had any televisions, right? So uh, all of a sudden, some guy got this big idea to get a television. Of course, it worked for about two weeks, and and then it fell apart. This was back in the old days with TV tubes, you know, little tubes in the back. And they bring it to my dad, you know, and they say, George, my dad's name was George. Says, George, fix my TV. And he says, What do you mean? I, you can do it. I know you can. You're a white guy. You know, you can fix it. And he says, I don't know how to fix TVs. I know nothing about it. Don't be like that. You just don't want us to have a TV. And he said, well, no, it's not that. And so my dad would take it, and he'd put the tubes in the back of the truck, drive all over the reservation on the corrugated roads, come back and put them in. Of course, it was working, so everybody thought he was a TV repairman. But the idea is, is that everything can be done. Everybody knows how to do everything. Where I grew up, everybody knew how to make Indian shoes, which people call moccasins, which is nothing like this thing you buy in the store. It's very complex. Everybody knew how to make reed mats. Everybody knew how to make a pottery. Everybody knew how to weave this thing, how to carve that, how to tan the hide, how to grind mush, how to grow corn, how to husk this, how to make a a decurnaler. Everybody knew how to do absolutely everything. But some people knew how to do some of those things way better than other people. So, you know, like if you wanted a really cool pair of shoes, you know, for a certain ceremony, you went to this other guy down on the corner 
And if you talked to him real nice and it brought the materials, he would make them for you. But you could make them too. You knew how. But he would do it really, really good. And on and on and on. So when you get to a place where um, people are terrified, you see, it's because they feel that everything is scarce, that you can't do anything. And, okay, what's going to happen if this caves in or the electricity doesn't work? (laughs) You know, what's the difference? This New Mexico never works anyway. But, uh, you know, just uh, get together. You've got your hands. You know how to do stuff. You you can cook this, make that. We're going to do it, you know. So that uh, lack of ingenuity is not a lack that's natural. It's inside all the people, but mostly gets used in order to mine the earth or take something out of the world, some sort of extraction, in order to get enough money, in order to continue being an atrophied person. So it's important to know how to do things, but it's also important to do things so that you don't ruin something else, you know, in the doing of it. So I think, you know, I mean... I, I, in Bullet's Kitchen, we have, uh, in the morning, it's all lectures, you know. And in the afternoon, it's all hands-on learning. And people don't know how to tie knots. They don't know how to, um, how you spread metal on an anvil. They don't know how to make an anvil out of a, out of a railroad rail. There's so many things that you just learn when you're like two and three and four years old, how to spin this, how to turn that, how this goes, what happens when you do the water. All these things are just natural to us as people. And when that's taken away from us, we become the most depressed cultures in the world. And then we start taking medication instead of learning how to do things. You got to go outside. You got to do stuff, man. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I know I made that first saddle, which was I still have. It's pretty funky. But um, I made uh, lots of really good saddles after that. But from that first one, I learned how to make saddles. And after that, I made wonderful saddles. You know, well, I think they're wonderful. They look really cool, that's for sure. But, um, and they're also good for the horses, you know. You don't have any bald spots or nothing, man. So you can do things. People can do things, and they just feel like they just can't, you know, because it's been demonized to work with your hands as a peasant. You say, oh, you work with your hands. Oh, that means you must be an old folk, and you're in an old folks' home, so they're just, you know, just entertaining you. Or you didn't really make it to the top where you just push a few buttons and point, you know. No, man. Hey, there's a great story. Let me tell you. In, in the old days, there was a, a king. His name was Ateas. He was a Scythian king, a, a horse nomad. lived on the other side of the, uh, what is it there, on the other side of the Ukraine, what is now Kazakhstan. And the Macedonians, you know, um, so-called Alexander the Great's father, wanted to conquer these people, but he could never do it. And so he, he, he decided to do something different. He would... Um, send an emissary there to get them to build a statue of Hercules, and they would have to build a bridge over the Pontus to allow his armies to come in to do that. It was all just a a ploy. So they sent these emissaries to find the Scythian king. They went for days on end, days on end. They finally came to this old guy with long white hair, you know, with no shirt on, with a blue buckskin pants covered in gold deer, you know, gold deer plaques all the way to the ground, combing his horse's mane and combing out his tail. He says, sir, can you please lead me to your king? He said, what do you want with him? He says, well, we want to make a statue, you know, of Hercules, and we want to pay them to do it and let us come in their land. He says, well, I am the king. <laughs> he says, why are you combing your own horse? He says, what the hell does your king do? He says, well, he has somebody else comb his horse. He says, then he's lazy and he's atrophied. Let him come over here and try to take my land. I'll show him where it's at. And they did. And this guy was in his 90s, you know, this old king. And he deliberately wrote it to the other king when he came in and was killed in the battle, which was the whole idea was to die in battle. So he died actually on horseback, which was his whole dream and his whole life. And he still beat the Macedonians and beat them back. So, I mean, the whole idea is, is that even though you're the king, you milk your own sheep, you till your own fields, you comb your own horse, you ride your own animals, you still hug your own children, you do your own work. You got to have that hand moving or you fall apart, you know? You have no eloquence if you don't use your hands. And it's not about doing it as therapy. It's about the joy of having that capacity, you know, as a human, to make things and know how to do things. It's amazing what people know. I'd like to, that nicely leads into another quote from the book, which I'll read here. The post-World War II New Mexico Indian Reservation I was raised in was exceptional 
for they arduously worked at retaining their culture, dress, food, language, ceremonialism, agriculture, and horses, not by freezing it all in an image or liturgical re recitation, but by navigating their tribal fate in a unique way of their own invention, whereby the core of who they are decolonized what they absorbed before they were absorbed by it, indignifying it all. They did not reject the incoming culture. They converted it to their purposes. Jesus became an Indian, iron a type of sacred flint. Wheat became Jesus's corn and horses came from the sea and sun. And San Esteban and San Rafael, the horses' <laughs> saints, became native deities. The mandatory so-called white American education system worked hard to cloud and eradicate this clear and real vision. The generation of native youths that came just after my time in school reacted to this pro-Middle America proselytizing by becoming even richer, more affected, more acceptable to fancy art museums, cultural events, and all sorts of money ventures to outrun the system of the whites by being better at it than they were. All of course, in hopes of maintaining their tribal self-esteem by doing so. But the whiteness in so-called white people was a tricky phenomenon. Quote unquote, whites were a product of their own ancestors' cultural losses to the same process they now peddled and pushed onto the natives. There was no proviso in any of that for the survival of magic indigenous vision in anything they were teaching or living out because they had lost their own. I'm so amazed that you read that. Um, I don't mean out loud, but that uh, you read and absorbed it. That's, it makes me feel extremely hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> and no, it really does. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they want to read about horse, and then they just gloss these, you know, pontifications of mine. But uh, that's that's wonderful that you uh, you feel that that's a significant thing to understand. Very good. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is something that I contemplate frequently, especially today. I mean, in Canada, the idea of truth and reconciliation, and I'm sure you've heard about in the news the, sure. the all the children's bodies they're finding at the mm. residential schools. Yeah, horrible, yeah. Horrible, horrible stuff. Unbelievable. And, yeah. and, you know, my ancestors, the white guys, are the ones who perpetrated this stuff. And I just, I wonder, where did this sickness begin? Do you have any comments on that? Hey, I mean, all come okay, from you're going to... You got to come to Bolad's kitchen. That's the first question we always ask. Mm. First of all, there are no white guys. Whiteness is a figment of white people's imagination. It was created around the 1400s in Europe. The Scots, for instance, you come from Scots. There were no Scots in Scotland. They came from somewhere else, and before that, somewhere else too. And they were in indigenous peoples as well. So the the whole uh, idea of whites being the perpetrators is actually a troubling thing because you can't get anywhere with it because there's no people behind it. It's totally a concept. It's like the Chinese, who um, also uh, they were very terrible to many of their indigenous peoples, not only now, but for the last 3,000 years, were never a people. Most of them were um, of the same exact people that they ran over. Like, if you look at each dynasty of peoples in Europe and dynasties in China, this is what Bullet Kitchen is all about, is that you will find that, for instance, the first wave, in the other book, you know, the Rescuing the Law, I have some quotes about that. The people invading a certain area either invade it or they are in turn squashed and become part of the society. When their cousins start to come into the the same country, they see them as an invasion force instead of visitors, you see. Mm -hmm. And they don't recognize their own barbarian selves on the other side of the hill. They're the exact same people. And so the perpetration of uh, this kind of terror of trying to make everything flattened, I mean, there's a part in this book where you can read, and in the next book, there's lots of it. It's too easy to say, oh, the white guy did this, because as soon as you do that, what you get is a payoff from the white guy. And what the, the so-called whiteness 
then gives you something in retribution or, you know, to compensate. But no, you can't accept it, man, because what has to happen is the people have to find their indigenous soul and realize that when you lose your indigenous soul, you start promoting this husk of a human being, which is not like this race or that race, but a cultural phenomenon I call the syndrome. Because once you have a people who are fleeing what we call in Bullets Kitchen the unthinkable thought, you know, this great Western uh, movement that started up around the, oh, 1800 B.C., where everybody's constantly going west, constantly going west, constantly going west. Was the United States invasion was, and South America were all part of the same thing. You, um, you know, I mean, you end up getting uh, this idea that the people who are invading have some kind of culture or they have some kind of, of uh, what you might say, identity as a people, but they don't. They're not people. They're infinite amounts of this syndrome and people uh, being made in this syndrome, being very easy to plunder and overrun indigenous people, indigenous plants, indigenous forests, indigenous animal, indigenous land. And then when you come to the end of the wall, all you've got is yourself. And now we see entropically the whole thing starting to destroy. So what's good in people is good in all people, but there has to be a person there to begin with. So a person going around saying, mea culpa, mea culpa, I'm a white guy, I brought this upon these people. Yeah, you've got to recognize that, but that doesn't do anything for the natives at all. That doesn't bring them to uh, themselves, because what happens is then the natives get in their identity out of having been done to. And um, so what was so great about the tribe where I lived in is they didn't have that. They, they, they didn't absorb it. They didn't, like, take in everything that the conquerors made. They reenacted the whole thing in ritual form every year, constantly, adding on what happened last year to what happened, you know, <laughs> you know, 500 years before. And so it's really easy to fight against what you hate. It's really hard to f- struggle for what you love. I mean, it's very, very difficult. So these things, these are, these are big, big, big questions. I don't think we have the time to go into the reality of what that really entails. But you have to understand that. From my point of view, there aren't indigenous people and non-indigenous people. There is the indigenous, and then there is the people who have lost their indigenous and when you have lost your indigenous, you have to constantly mine something to fill that great vacancy that's in your whole, in your in your center as a whole. And anybody that's got any you know thing left, they're going to take every bit of it, and they've got to flatten it and they've got to uh, nix it so that they feel comfortable. And then once you've done that, you say, God, where are we going to go now? Let's go to Alpha Centauri, and do it there too. So the the idea of a a colonial culture cannot be extirpated because that's a colonial idea. The thing is the grief has to be recognized, the reality has to be recognized, it has to be recognized what's gone on and why it's gone on. And it ain't so simple as just them guys and us guys or these guys and those guys. It's not that simple, you know. I mean Canada, you know, had a different way of getting rid of Indians. In the United States they just shot them all, you know, and poisoned the ones they couldn't shoot. In Guatemala, they didn't kill them all. They exploited them all. And so there's, there's a, still a shitload of Indians in Guatemala. I mean, Guatemala is basically an Indian country. You know, you have 11 million Indians there and probably 7 million non-Indians. And so the, the issue about, uh, you know, how do you make this good? It can't be made good. It's not going to be good. It has to be accepted as a platform from where we proceed from now. And uh, Native Americans have lots of takes on this. I'm not going to put words in the mouths of the different tribes and people who have uh, found out about all this stuff, but most everybody knew what was going on all along, couldn't do anything about it. So I, we had local guys here when they were trying to do the boarding school stuff, you know. It's before my time. There was a guy named Black, uh, Black Horse, yeah. He was a Navajo guy. He won't let none of his kids go to the boarding schools. And he won. He actually won. But then there was this one guy, this priest, this Catholic priest, who was a German. He was actually, Robert Hartley, he was kind of a cool guy. He started a school where no one was required to go to it. And he would actually pick him up and deliver him in his wagon. This was before cars, you know. 
And uh, this guy, Legini, he decided that he was going to let his kids go with this because the adults were allowed to come too. And he became so beloved of the people. To this day, his school's still there. I mean, nobody goes to it because it's not happening. But it was amazing. Um, you can't just say these are the bad guys and these are the good guys. This is too easy. Uh, let me tell you, I really want to. Don't get me wrong. You know, I would love it. All right, there's the bad guys there. Let's go get them, you know. Oh, God. You know, you charge up that hill and you come over to here with all your guys and then you look down in there and what do you see? A mirror with your face on it. Oh, damn. <laughs> I don't like that. I want the bad guys to be there and me to win. But it's not like that. It just ain't like that. So there's a lot more to this story. I don't want anybody to think it's that simple. But... To understand where this all originates from, it does not originate from 17th century Europe. It does not originate from 14th century Europe. It does not originate with the Greeks. It's so much older than all that. And that's why I invent Bullet Kitchen as a school, to look into that myself. Because you got to realize, I, where I grew up on the reservation, every morning I got to look up or in the night and see Los Alamos where they invent the atom bomb. Right above us. This little bomb city, you know, right in the most sacred site of all the Pueblo peoples, right up there. And then the bottom of Chicoma. And I would just sit there, even as a kid, I would think, because my dad was a flyer in World War II, and he hated airplanes ever since. He hated war, he hated mechanization. And I would say, how is it given another chance? This is where we end up again with these guys on top of us. And yet, as time went on, I started realizing, ah, oh, that's too simple, baby. It's not that simple. So, yeah. And not only is it not that simple, but every one of us has a colonist inside us, and every one of us has an indigenous person inside us. But you can't claim indigenosity and then obviate the reality of the stupidity, as you say, of what the whites have done. We have all those things inside. So that's why it's so important to learn all the languages, learn all the capacities with the hands, and to become a people from which we can descend, and, and uh, for a time we will not see, but, for, but we'll, somebody else will see. So we become worthy of descending from. You can't fix what happened in the past. This is so maddening for the youth, you know. They want to go to litigation, you know. I have a friend whose father was the great um, lawyer for the Haudenosaunee tribe, you know, up there in Akwesasne, for this land in New York and parts in Canada. Spent 35 years in one case, over and over and back. And he became more and more a white guy as he did it, more and more a white guy as he did it. Finally won it. But after he won it, he wasn't an Indian anymore. And what they got didn't make it so the rest of the people could be Indians either. So his daughter is one of my you know, best friends. And she said, man, that's the thing with Bullet Kishin. That's what you're teaching is just that. Half the time, the stuff we lost, it's the settlers that kept some of it alive. But we can't say the settler kept it alive. It's just an irony they kept it alive. Because all the corn seeds that, you know, Sullivan burnt, and all the horses that everybody took, all these things, it was the white guys that had them for us to get them back. And if they hadn't taken we wouldn't have them. So somebody else would kill everything. The ironies are the, is where God lives, you know. So when you get down to it, the terror of litigation and all that is, is that you can't heal anything with that. The recognition of the injustice, sure. Yeah, of course. And the unfairness of it. Um, what you would call, uh, you know, peace. How is peace going to be achieved by finally accusing yet somebody else of a crime? It just becomes state-run vengeance. So in the end... We've got to start making a situation that heals a problem in the future, one that hasn't happened yet that's getting ready to happen, so that we become ancestors worth descending from, and we don't find, you know, 3,000 children's bodies in mass graves, which, by the way, is only the tip of the iceberg. Mm. You know, we have it here, too. They just, you know, everybody's scurrying around trying to hide it. So. Yeah. In Guatemala, man. I've seen so much killing and so much uh, hatred of natives and stuff like that. They're going on now. They're going on, you know, only 10, 20 years ago. It never even made the news up here. See, so there's, I'm not saying belittling in any way, you know, the Anishinaabek uh, struggle. 
but uh, a lot of people are trying to get a hell of an identity out of that. And you got to get an identity out of who you are, not because the white guy is all of a sudden the guy's calling the shots again by being your opponent. Because whoever you will oppose, you will end up becoming. That's the problem. Whoever you fight, you end up becoming entangled, and your children will be entangled with them for centuries. So the main thing is to get on with being yourself. You know, doesn't mean you shouldn't have the recognition. Doesn't mean you shouldn't let everybody know what happened. Definitely, but you can't get it. You can't leave it there. It's got to go a lot farther than that. And it can't be the white guy. You can't ask to change. You got to make it yourself. Because the white guy is not a person. The real indigenous person that's in the white guy is the one that's got to emerge. And then we'll have people again. And then we'll all have people. Different kinds of cultures. Not one and two and three and four. Many, 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 many. Uh Uh-oh, you got me on the bandwagon, man. I like that. There you go. (laughs) I told you. The Irishman kicked in. (laughs) I don't even drink, man, you know. (laughs) Forget it, you know. (laughs) Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you were a smart interviewer. You got me going. Oh, yeah. well, thank you so much, Martin, for opening that and and extrapolating on it and sharing your beautiful words about well, it. Well, you know what I want to do is I want to thank you for reading this book because you obviously did. And you also saw and listened and felt some of the things I was trying to get across. And all about the idea of grief and riding to let the horse bring you home, you see. Because it's all about being at home, man. Because the so-called white guy, he's just never, ever been at home. That's why he's got to hike instead of walk beautifully where he lives. Martin, last night before I went to bed, I was saying my prayers and just asking for guidance in my dreams around this interview today. And I had this. <laughs> Am I that terrifying? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was that scary. <laughs> All right, I'll remember that. <laughs> and I had I had this beautiful dream where you were there and you were playing your guitar and singing this oh. beautiful lament, and I felt like crying. Now, this is not a live interview, so I feel okay putting you on the spot. I don't know if that's even possible for you to, or if you feel inspired to share a song of some kind. Well, I have a whole other life as a musician, you know, I mean, even another name at one point, but <laughs> we won't go into that, <laughs> you know, things we do with kids, you know. but uh, yeah, no, definitely, we all got to sing, man, and horses love singing, you know, this is a Navajo riding song, you know. Mm. Yeah, part of one. Yeah. All my horses are beautiful, and we're beautiful as we go. You know. Wow. <laughs> You just do it with the horse's rhythm of his bridle, you know, like that. And the horse don't even get a sore back. Read the next book. talks all about it. Right. The next one is called mm-hmm. The Wild Rose, Stories of My Horse. Wild Rose. Too. When's that yep. coming out? Oh, I couldn't talk anybody into wanting to do it till spring. Okay. I was going to put it out this fall, but it's not going to come out till probably March. Okay. It's all done. All the paintings are done. All the drawings are done. It's pretty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's my favorite one. Yeah. Oh. And the one we're speaking about blue. today? What's that? The one we're speaking about today is called The Mare and the Mouse, Stories of My Horses, yeah. Volume 1. And it is beautiful, not just the words, but the your drawings and images and the, the cover of the book Thanks. is beautiful. It's a pretty little book, yeah. Yeah. It's a little uh, publisher in Minnesota. They're two students of mine who inherited it from their mother, who used to just do little old mystery novels, and they really wanted to do beautiful books. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you this one as a gift. And then you put it out and see if you can do it. And they struggle like hell to do it, but they did it. And so it's quite beautiful. And my other publishers, 
even though they came on top of each other, they were totally for it, and they love it too. So it's just a great thing to happen in this world for a change in this crazy dog eat dog world. You know, everybody's wow. happy. Imagine that. Yeah, exactly what I said. <laughs> Imagine that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Two publishers should be fighting each other and suing each other, and they're like, "Oh, this is great. We'll help each other out." I said, oh, all yeah, right, cool. It's totally right. accidental, but yeah. Martine Prechtel, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today from from everyone in the Banyan Books community. And I'll just give a shout out and acknowledgement to our wonderful producer Jacob Steele, who makes all of these amazing free programs accessible and happening for everybody. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Colin Limworth, who is the founder and, and owner of Banyan Books and everybody on the staff and team front and back of the store that makes Banyan Books possible. And of course, the community of amazing support in the whole Banyan Books community worldwide. Martine, thank you for, for being with us again. And, and I look forward to, to speaking to you again sometime not too far away. Sure, give us all life and uh, my blessings on all the people listening and all the people who read my books out there. Thank you so much. And blessings on all the natives there struggling with their struggles and blessing on that beautiful and beautiful land you guys got up there in British Columbia and the water. Oh, my gosh. You know, only people from the desert appreciate it. You guys have no appreciation for where you live. We really appreciate it, man, because it's so beautiful up there. So, all blessings. Thank you. Thank you.